So welcome everybody. Happy Wednesday. Good morning or afternoon or even evening, depending on where you're located. Super excited to be hosting this Ask a Chief of Staff workshop today with Rachel. Um, if you haven't read her bio already, but Rachel is the CEO and founder of Woken, and she's going to be helping all of our chiefs of staff in the room today kind of think through your next career step by sharing a couple of proven career path exploration frameworks. So don't worry if you aren't able to write down everything. We're going to be sharing this presentation and recording with everyone who is registered. And um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rachel so she can introduce herself and get started. But I would love if everybody gave a huge virtual round of applause to welcome Rachel to the room. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks for joining Thank us today. You. Thank you so much. I'm going to also share screen. So let me know if you can see everything OK. Um, yes. OK. And just so everyone knows, I have the chat open. So if you have questions throughout the slides, please chime in and I will monitor and I will take Q&A throughout, even in the midst of the presentation. And we'll definitely have time at the end. And I love that we've gotten start with this icebreaker already. And there's so many amazing points that you guys have and questions that you have already. So I'm definitely going to go through a bunch of stuff. And so if I don't answer the question, I want to come back to everything that you guys are writing in the chat. So please ask it again. I think for right now, it's always good just to see that we have a lot of people sharing in similar challenges. So at the very least, we're feeling that sense of camaraderie, but please ask all of those questions again so that I can comment and make sure I get to everything, uh, even if it's not in the slides itself. Yes. Okay, so we're going to dive in. Um, just, like, just hearing all oh background noise. So just want to make sure we're good. Okay. I think we're good. Um, okay. Um, cool. So quick background. I started out in the corporate world. I was at Goldman Sachs and Bridgewater Associates doing operations and then HR. I did a little HR research at Aon Hewitt. I did coaching training at NYU School of Professional Studies, and I got certified through the International Coach Federation. I did a tech MBA through NYU Stern, and I've done career coaching through a variety of organizations in addition to building my own company for the past five and a half years. And what Woken does is we make sure that every single individual and professional can be thoughtful and intentional with every single career decision. So we help people with career path exploration, upskilling decisions, personal branding, job searching, overall advancement, and just simply navigating your entire journey. There's so many different uh, elements of career goals and challenges, so we really help with all of it and making sure you have the support that you need uh, to, to be guided and, and supported at, at, at all stages. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Happy to talk about anything in my background if it's helpful, and we can sort of come back to that. Um, I also wanted to do another super quick icebreaker. Uh, so let us know in the chat, are you currently a chief of staff debating what's next? Are you someone who's maybe exploring what it might look to look look like to get into a chief of staff path or something else? I kind of wanted like a quick A, B, or C, uh, just to get a super quick sense of who we have here. And um, I'm going to monitor some responses. Cool. Okay. We've got a little bit of everything, which is awesome. And that's kind of what I predicted. So that's why I asked. It's helpful for me to know, but it's, look, it's all going to be applicable to your stage, whether you're in really any of these. So again, let me know your specific questions and really keep that question that you asked in the first icebreaker, because I want to come back to it, but this is helpful. Um, okay. So I'm going to breeze through the agenda, but I'm basically today going to give you as much food for thought as it relates to career exploration as I possibly can, and then we will be able to answer all of your specific Q&A. Um, all right, you know, for the sake of time, I'm actually going to just skip this um, because it's not as important to this talk right now, and I want to just get to the good stuff. Um, why is it important to find a job that you love or align with? Well, you'll get better at doing it. Uh, you'll get better at that job. You'll make more money doing it. Um, and it will make it more efficient for you to job search. A lot of people just dive into job search 
when they're not sure what they want. And, you know, I'm here to sort of introduce a phase and what can you do in exploration to get the clarity you need, um, you know, before you start applying to anything. Um, and it's going to make your career advancement and career development more organic versus feeling choppy or forced or unclear, lost, confused. We don't want you to feel stressed. We want you to feel like you can just simply evolve and grow naturally. And you're going to feel relieved and excited, right? It's, it, you know, it's often that we have stress behind these decisions, but when you feel clear on your direction, it's going to make it more fun and more enjoyable and more manageable and easier and effective in all senses um, of, of, of your, your phase here. Um, okay, so what I'm actually gonna do is start a little bit with just some mindset stuff um, in terms of, there's a lot of common limiting beliefs when you're making decisions around what's next for you. So I like to just start with, how are you showing up to these decisions? Um, and what are some of those uh, sometimes common limiting beliefs that we can actually just simply eradicate and that way you feel fully confident walking into your decision. So as I mentioned, um, stress sometimes often is a part of career decisions. I like to create structure to replace that feeling of stress. Because if you operate out of a place of stress, what are we typically gonna do? We open up the job boards and we start job hopping and we start applying to just the next best thing. But when you're feeling some sort of stress, it's a signal that you're ready for something new and different. Uh, you're ready to figure out what's next for you. And maybe you're not sure how to go about it. So what I like to do is take a step back and ask yourself what might be the process or level of support that I can gain to get from A to Z. And really asking yourself the question of what is the goal that I have right now? Is it to advance? Is it to find a new job? Is it to clarify my goal? Is it to upskill? Is it to improve my brand? What is it I'm actually needing to work on? And then how can I figure out the baby steps to work towards it? So give yourself a structure, give yourself a process and breaking down that stress into sort of a meaningful opportunity for progress versus just, you know, having that uh, stressful feeling, right? We want to utilize it to our advantage. The other element is security, right? Chief of staff is a great role. And when you're thinking about your next path, you may say, uh, you know, what's going to be a secure trajectory for me? I like to make sure that you're not only considering like, yes, salary is an important component of a path and of a decision, but your interest and your alignment and your fit with the role and the trajectory is just as important. So remember that you can and should incorporate both of these components into your decision. And when we do exploration, we're going to talk about how to do research and how to do networking and how to figure out your path. You can consider and should consider both the logistics of salary, as well as what path is suitable for me, right? We can't ignore what am I a fit for? We can't only think about the, the salary because I've seen it time and time again, where people only use that as their decision-making. And then what happens if you're not aligned with the role? That's not so secure after all, right? A lot of people are you know, not so sure what they can do, what they're capable of. So before you tell yourself that you can't do something, tell yourself that you'll learn, right? A, you'll learn about what these paths are and you're learning about, you know, can you grow your skills? Can you look at your propensities and your affinities and your tendencies and, you know, where you can develop into versus here's only the things I've done before and I'm not sure what else I can do or what I can learn. Be open-minded to what's out there and what you might be capable of and let yourself feel informed first and foremost before you decide what you can or can't do. Um, you know, and, and this is sort of related, but sometimes people only look at what's in my past. What are the past role titles, skills, projects? What about your story? Especially for a chief of staff, when you've done so many different things, we're going to hopefully help you pinpoint which element of that do you want to maybe double down on to figure out your trajectory going forward. When you explain to someone what you're interested in doing and why and why you know it's a fit for you and the fact that you've done your homework on what those roles are all about and why you're a fit and why you're interested, that story is going to be really compelling and authentic. So it's not just what you've done, but it's why and why do you think you're a fit and what do you understand about that trajectory and you know there's a lot of ways to make that story um really resonate right and so it's not just what you've done but it's 
uh, the go forward and, and making sure the story makes sense to you and thus will make sense to others. A lot of people think very long term. I like to think, let's call it 60 to 70 percent short term, meaning what is the next role that would be a great fit for me? And then let's call it about 30 percent. You still want to be aware of like, say I were to move into the HR team or say I were to move into the strategy team or say I were to move into the product team or the marketing or whatever team. Where could it lead me in the future? You want to understand the possibilities of where it could go, um, but you don't want to feel like you have to make a decision around like, where am I going to be in three decades time? You're going to change. The world's going to change. These roles and industries are going to change. So I like to over index more on what's a great fit for me now. And do I understand where it could lead me? And do I feel like the options it's going to open me up to? are options that I'm interested in, you know, because any one role, you know, there's so many uh, sort of varied ways that you could take that in the future as well. So you want to understand where do people typically take that role? What are some common pathways? Um, a lot of people say, I'm open to anything. I'm open to any role. I'm open to any industry. To me, that just means you're not sure about what you want. And it means that we need a little more learning, a little bit more research, a little bit more reflection. I like to say, be picky. I know that might be like uh, maybe excessive, but um, I, I'd rather, I actually have a blog, which is why being narrow in your direction in your job search is actually going to benefit you. It doesn't mean you're going to be closed off. It doesn't mean you're going to have less opportunities. You can go find more of the right thing. But when you say you're open to any role or open to multiple options, it means we're not sure enough yet of what is the right fit. And we need to do a little more exploration. So that's a little bit of a signal that you can use. Um, you know, sometimes there's only so many roles we're aware of. It's okay to say, I'm not sure. I'm learning more. I'm trying to understand. Now, the good news is the chief of staff role gives you so much exposure. You've probably seen all the different functions at a company, but it's okay to say, I'm not sure. I'm looking into these things. I'm learning. I'm exploring. And especially when you're networking or even if you're in a social setting or a family's function, your ability to say, I'm looking into A, B, C, and D lets someone else meet you where you're at and give you some resources or give you some introductions to help you explore those options, right? Don't just feel like you have to force it and just pick out of a hat and just pick what you're aware of. Um, there might be more things beyond your current level of knowledge and exposure. A lot of people think about interviewing as this thing we have to check the box, we have to do it well. Yes, but it's also a conversation and you want to choose which conversations that you actually want to be in. I like to say that networking and interviewing are a mirror into the job that you may hold. This is a conversation where we're talking about what problems we're going to solve and how we're going to do it. So yeah, who do you want to converse with, when, where, why, and see it as an opportunity and a, and a mirror to the work you would go do in that journey, right? Instead of just like, I have to tell them what they want to hear. Don't force it and really see those uh, interviews as, as an opportunity. Um, a lot, another thing that people often trip up on is just applying, applying, applying. Everything's about applying, applying, applying. Explore, learn, research, network. I'm going to show you how to do that. But just remember, it's okay to learn about what's out there. It's okay to reflect and learn about yourself until you feel clear. Don't feel like the only thing you can possibly do is just apply to jobs, right? Uh, make sure you have that clarity first and foremost. Um, you know, oftentimes we look at others around us. And in this, in the case of this talk, it might be great to chat with other people who used to be in a chief of staff role. And it's great to look at what paths are typical or common or where could it go. But sometimes looking at others around us can also be a source of stress. So just make sure if and when you leverage others in your journey, that it's a source of positive information, motivation, guidance, uh, resources, where can others plug in to help you? But if you notice that you're doing this like comparison game, I always say just eyes back on your own paper uh, as if we're in school and just say, how can I focus on my next step? What is the thing I can do next to get a little more information, to get a little bit more clarity and utilize others in a way that actually serves you? Fear is totally normal and totally common. It's a little bit connected to that stress topic. I always say replace fear with learning. If you're not sure about something, again, that's an opportunity to ask a question and get some answers and get some information and reflect on what you're learning. So use that opportunity of what are you hesitating about? 
What are you not sure about? Do you need information or do you need reflection? And how can we use these things as a signal and an opportunity for how you can uh, really continue pursuing the exploration and get more clarity versus just feeling stuck in the fear, right? So really leverage these things as tools uh, in your process. Um, cool. Um, which mindset are you going to take with you in the future? Uh, I don't know if any or any of these resonated, but I'd like to give you a moment and say, which positive thing might you take forward with you as you're making career decisions for yourself? And it might be something not even on this list, but tell us in the chat if there's something that you feel like you're going to, you know, hold as a tool in your toolbox going forward, something you might need to remind yourself so that you're making decisions that are from the right place, from an informed place and not limiting yourself in any way. Um, yes, story. Great, Beth. I love that. What's your story? Amazing. What else are you going to take with you going forward? Breaking down your stress as an opportunity for progress. Yes. And you will learn. Yes, exactly. Learning to me is like kind of the key to life. Um, what else? What else are we going to take with us? Being picky, conversing, networking. Yes, 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 yes. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, security versus interest. Yes, amazing. Good, good, good. Um, cool. So how do you think about your next work opportunity? I have a three-part framework that I think is super handy for you to both reflect on past roles and even think about future roles. So here's the three parts. I call it function, content, environment. Function means what are you doing all day? What are the activities, the projects, the skills, and how does that relate to your affinities and your tendencies and what you're natural at and what you're great at? These are the action verbs and phrases of what goes into the day-to-day -day and the week of physically, what are you doing? It's sort of these action verbs and skills that align for you based on what you're like, what you're great at, what you're natural at, what you could get great at. The second piece is content. And this is really kind of like, what problem are we all solving and what is the nature of the work and what is the topic area? In essence, this is going to relate to the sector that you're in, but why are we all here? What is the problem? Who are we helping? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? The reason I separate these two things is because say you're function is to do research or training or sales or consulting or really anything you can think of the nature as to what who are you training on what right or what are you who are you selling and what are you selling right or what are you researching depending on the function versus the content two totally separate things and the third thing is the environment so work environment that you thrive in the pace the size of the organization, the people around you, whether it's remote, all the bells and whistles of what does it look and feel like in an ideal work environment for you. Now, these are the words we commonly hear, role, industry, culture. These are the wor words we talk about. I try to break it down into the root and the principles of how you can think about each of these things, but it's important to separate role versus industry as well as culture. So this is a three-part framework. If you're ever trying to figure out what do I need? What do I want? Where am I at? Where do I have clarity? Where do I not have clarity? In an ideal world, we want you to feel clear on each of these three buckets and what are your priorities? What are your preferences and what makes the most sense for you? So whenever you're thinking about clarity, each of these three is a, is a good framework to come back to. Um, okay, now, I'm actually going to guide you guys right here and now through a mini little assessment exercise uh, where you can actually start reflecting on what it is you're great at, what you love doing. So grab a pen and paper. You could obviously digitally type if you have a notepad or you can handwrite either way. Um, but give me a quick thumbs up whenever you're ready. And I'm actually going to take five or 10 minutes and give you guys a moment right here and now to just reflect on who you are, what you're all about. And that way you can make sense of it for your future career decisions. Um, so let me just make sure I'm looking at everyone. And is everyone, I see Emma's giving me a thumbs up. Any Anyone else? Lucy, thank you. All right, Anya, thank you. Beautiful. Okay, so we're gonna go through each of those three sections. The first section is the function. So these are those action verbs and phrases. 
Where I want you to start is think of a few experiences. By the way, this could be in your current role. It could be in a previous role. This could be in any of your years of your experience professionally or even personally. I want you to think about a few experiences where you either chose to take on that project or you just really, really enjoyed it. Like your top most enjoyable projects, experiences, professionally, could be personally, um, and it could go back however far you needed to. But if you had to pick your top one or two or three experiences that you most enjoy, or maybe you chose to take on, take 20 seconds and try to, and again, you do not need to write a full paragraph. Just try to write something that will remind you of which those experiences were. And I'll give you a few seconds on each of the prompts. Okay, now pick out of those few experiences, which is the top one that's most interesting to you. And then what I want you to do is flesh out the verbs or the sub elements, the actions that went into that. So for example, if you were doing some consulting project, what went into it? Did you have to do market research and then you had to synthesize uh, you know, a, a proposal and then you had to present it? I'm making this up, but what were the actions that went into that experience? If you had to break it down into a few components or action verbs and phrases, what were those skills that went into that? I'll give you a few seconds on each of the prompts. And I know I'm going fast. You can always come back to this. Um, but once you start that list, what I want you to do is just continue the list. So you might be starting to have some verbs and skills and phrases that relate to that one experience. Then when you start to look back just at the list in general, these are things hopefully that you like doing, enjoy doing, might feel natural at. How do you continue that list? What else is something you really enjoy, something you're good at, something you're natural at, how do you just start sort of adding to the list? And if someone were to ask you to do a project today, and imagine this is at a fictional company. It could be any company, not just your current organization. If someone were to ask you to do a project today, what would you want them to ask you to do? What would that project be? If you could, if, if this is fictionally a fictional boss, fictional company, any company, right? What should they ask you? What would you want to be given as a project or what would you want to start and work on? And think of times when you've helped others or what others come to you for help with. What do you enjoy helping others with? Okay, I'm going to keep going for the sake of time. You can always come back to this. Section two is what I call content. So I want you to start brainstorming. What are some topics that you like to read about or listen to or even think about or talk about? If you're following certain things on the news or on a podcast or whoever you follow across all the different spaces with so much information these days, what are you really paying attention to? What conversations or topics or problems are you most really following, let's say, right? And, and intrigued by and, and digesting that information and choosing to stay up to date on those topic areas. And problems in the world that you feel need solving. Problems where you're just like, <laughs> how? Does this still exist? 
which is so much. We have so many things we need to work on. Which problems come to the top of your list in the world, right? Topics you love learning about, topics you love talking about. You might talk about it so much so that your friends and family are bored listening to you about it. And another way you can think about this is products or services that you find interesting or important or innovative or intriguing. It could be a product that you rave about it. It could be a product you want to try. It could be a physical storefront service, anything that you're, you know, again, usually we rave about these things to the people around us. They may or may not want to listen, but things you recommend to others, things you're really feeling energized about, excited about, intrigued by something you've used or want to try products or services that stand out to you. Okay. Now, we're going to go to section three, work environment. Size of company, small, medium, large. Sometimes the grass is greener and we just want to try something we've never experienced before. But in terms of what environment you feel aligns with your personality, like what size organization do you think you thrive in? What pace organization do you think you thrive in? Do you want to travel? Do you want to work fully remote, hybrid, or in person? And really, what are the people like? You know, what are the traits of the culture around you that you really need for you to thrive? Um, and sometimes I like to, you know, you could close your eyes and actually, are you seeing something? Are you seeing a co-working space? Are you seeing people buttoned up in suits and ties? Or, you know, what is it, what's the vibe you're getting just in your intuition or maybe in your mind's eye? Um, what, what do you want and need most in an ideal work environment? Awesome. Okay. I am going to reshare um, and we are going to keep going. I hope this was helpful. I know I went quickly and Sam, I see your question there. Um, at the very least, we'll have the recording. If uh, I'll think about how I can uh, easily put together maybe a PDF of some of the reflections as well. Um, but for the sake of time, let's keep going. So I'm going to take a step back. What is career exploration? It is a process that is distinct from and a precursor to the job search. And just confirming you guys can see my slides, hopefully. Um, but career exploration is really where you're going to learn and reflect to figure out what path you are most confident in. It is meant to give you the space and the structure and the uh, really just time and space to figure this out before you apply anywhere. You are going to prioritize and compare and contrast the different options and relate them back to yourself. Why does this have to happen before job search? Of course, first of all, it's going to make it more efficient. If you're all over the place and applying to a million different things, it's going to be confusing. It's going to be overwhelming to you and to everyone else, and it's going to slow you down. Um, remember, just because you're narrowing in and you know what makes sense for you doesn't mean you have to find less. You're going to find more of the right thing. Interview effectiveness is another uh, really important thing. A lot of people just practice what do they want to hear from me versus how am I going to be most compelling and most authentic? It's if you know why you're there, are you in the right interview? Are you having the right conversation? Who are you? What's a fit for you? What are you all about? Right. And, and how are you going to have the most compelling, effective, blow them away interview? It's because you know, you're in the right room and the right conversation job fulfillment. We want to increase the odds that we're going to be happy once we get on the job. Right. And that we're going to have uh, the greatest, you know, room for potential and growth and really in, be engaged at work. No one wants to choose a role that you're not going to be happy in. So increasing the odds of finding that fulfillment. Okay, here's how to go about the process. So first and foremost, we've got the motivation and the accountability. You've got to ask yourself, am I in a moment where I'm ready to devote myself to just exploring. By the way, it doesn't have to take forever. It could take a week. It could take a month or two or three. It depends on your pace, but this does not have to take forever, but it is so important to do before you apply. So A, are you ready to devote to the process? Now, 
then you're going to keep reflecting. So the way we just did a little reflection a few minutes ago, we at Woken, we have an 80 question career assessment that allows you to reflect more, but you can also just keep reflecting on each of these three areas. So you can dive deep and you really want to understand um, how you relate to each of those three sections. Then you actually want to translate that first section into potential roles and the second section into potential industries. Remember, there's no assessment that can just spit out the answer right away. So what you are gonna do is come up with options that feel relevant. Yes, then we're gonna do a little research. Of course, there is online information available to us. We're gonna do a little bit to see what we can glean online, but we can't learn everything. If we were to, able to find clarity with just online research, this world would be a very different place. But what you really need to be doing is networking posting informational chats with people in the roles and in the industries that you're considering moving into. We can talk a little bit more about how to do that effectively. And actually on my website, I have a free downloadable list of good, really powerful, creative questions you can ask during these calls. Um, but you want to make sure you know how to handle these calls. Sometimes we show up to networking and we're not sure how to best utilize the time. So if you can really get creative with what you ask and how you ask it, you are going to paint such an accurate picture of what are these roles. Um, and then you do a little bit of what I call reflection and pivoting, really. So week over week, you have a few of these informational calls, you're doing research, you're doing reflection. That's going to allow you to pivot every single week to say, what else do I need to learn more about? What do I need to learn less about? What sounds interesting? What sounds fitting? What doesn't? And what learning do I need to do next? If you keep going through those pivot loops, that's what gets you to the clear direction. That's when you could decide, do I want upskilling or do I need upskilling? Is there a course or a certification or training that I want to use that aligns with my direction? That's also when you can start updating all of your branding materials and start job searching from there. If you haven't, if you still have options, you haven't done enough learning or reflection. So remember, if you have two or three roles you're still considering, what are the differences? What are the open questions that you have? How do you make sure to confidently know which one is the best possible fit amongst the options, right? Um, I'm gonna super, super quickly go into just like top tips for job searching. And then of course, um, we'll have time for a bunch of Q and A. Um, in job search, really ask yourself, am I being transactional versus really thinking about the root and the principles of, this is a conversation. Who do I wanna talk to? You know, about what, right? What conversations, what room should I be in? Uh, and who should I be talking to about what versus just like, I'm checking the box and I'm going to do this interview well because it's right in front of me, right? No check the box activity really ever serves us usually. Um, and are we plugging away heads down or are we reflecting? We have to pivot even within the job search. What are we gleaning? What are we feeling? What are we seeing? There's quantitative metrics. There's qualitative reflections. How are things going? And are we adjusting and informing a new direction uh, based on what we're seeing so far? Um, and are you clear on your direction, right? If you're applying to a multitude of things, that's likely not going to be serving you. Um, so make sure you feel like you are informing your direction. You might learn more during the job search and that's fine. Let that information drive what you apply to in the future based on what you're feeling, what you're seeing and what feels like a good fitting direction to you. You might learn more having done a few interviews, right? Um, and yeah, I always say, if your career search isn't fun, your job won't be either. So you want to enjoy the networking. You want to enjoy those interviews. Who are you talking to and about what, right? Use that as a mirror uh, for your future decisions. And just super quickly, so you guys know who we are at Woken, we help people with all of these different processes to guide you through every single step, teaching you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, why to do it, where to do it, and giving you the support and guidance you need along the way, and really just simply making sure you have effective career support at every single stage. And this is a little bit on how and where to find us. I'll make sure to pop that in the chat as well. And yeah, happy to take our 20 minutes and answer as many questions as you have and as you want. I know there were so many good things in the beginning of our chat. So feel free to pop some questions back into the chat now, or we can also scroll back up. But uh, yeah, Clara, let me know kind of if you want to come back to some of those earlier questions or, um, you know, where you want to go from here. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to give everybody like a minute or two. I'm sure there's many questions and they might take a little bit of time to type out. So feel free to throw those questions in the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll up and start to answer some of these that we had already earlier on, because I think there's a lot covered in this, in this workshop. Um, I know that there was a request for some of the questions. And so I know Rachel's going to put together a PDF for us and I'll share that in the follow-up email. So let's see here. Let's, let's ask one about pivoting careers and industries. Mm -hmm. I know this is a broad one, but let's say, you know, you have been in one particular industry and you're looking to pivot and you want to get narrow, right? Um, like you mentioned about what you want to do. Maybe how do you translate over the skill sets that you have into a new industry to make it super easy for the employer, hiring manager, interviewer to know I can do this job? Yeah. So role and industry are very different things. If you're trying to pivot both at once, it might be an opportunity for you to ask yourself, what's my priority? Would I rather say in a similar role and pivot industries or would I rather pivot role and then deal with industry later? Like doing both at once sometimes is a lot um, and they're very different. So if you're keeping a similar role and moving into a different industry, that's usually a little bit easier, right? Because the role is kind of the biggest like they're hiring you to uh, do a job. And so industry is a little bit more like, you know, what exposure do you have? Why are you interested personally? Why do you resonate with that? Why do you want to work here? That's a personal thing. You can really leverage, like, if you've personally been following a certain industry for years and you have knowledge that you may not even realize based on just gathering, you know, information that you read online um, that you choose to stay up to date with, that could be more than enough for someone saying, why do you want to work here? The fact that you resonate with their mission, the fact that you have a, a general understanding of that industry and where it's going and what's going on in the industry, those are things that could just be going on in your personal life. So you're now, if you wanted to, of course, add something else, you might go get more involved with that industry somehow. Maybe you start blogging about it. Maybe you join some webinars. Maybe you join some industry-based association or membership. You could do networking. You could do research. You could do projects. There's any number of ways of getting involved and increasing your exposure and your knowledge to a certain industry and showcasing that on your materials or as part of your interviews. If you're trying to pivot roles, that's more where, you know, uh, similarly, you can do any number of those things that I just mentioned, but really it becomes sort of like um, upskilling, right? You might have some sort of course or certification or boot camp or something to sort of propel you in that direction. Also showcasing the fact that you're doing the upskilling shows someone I'm really committed and invested in moving into this role or into this direction. It also might fill the gaps of your skills. Maybe you have, like Clara said, transferable skills, and then you need to plug the hole of the gap of, I need to learn this one extra thing. How can I do that with a little bit of hands-on learning? And by the way, hands-on learning could be a course certification. It could also be a project. Maybe it's pro bono. Maybe you start your own thing. Maybe you volunteer. Maybe you get involved with some startup for three to five hours a week over the course of a month or two. You could showcase that you really did something and have some experience, real world experience under your belt. So there's a lot of different ways to upskill. Um, it just depends role versus industry. And another thing I will say about pivoting roles is sometimes there's like step A before step B. So like, you know, if you know you want to go in some sort of direction, when you do the networking, you might ask someone, how can you tell me some stories or some trends or some commonalities about people who break into this role? You know, is there sort of a team that's a middle ground, like an adjacent team that I can sort of go one step closer and then maybe once I'm internally at the organization, then I can move another step closer. So sometimes there's stepping stones. Um, and, you know, you just want to understand the nuances. There's some roles that they'll only hire internal, you know, uh, internally. There's some roles where they'll hire externally. Sometimes there's patterns of, oh, we always look for chiefs of staffs to come into this role. Or sometimes they'll always look for any number of things. So patterns, trends, commonalities, these are questions you can ask and get stories and get data points and get examples for how does this really work um, when people move into this journey. And that's something you can learn from these networking conversations. I love that. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction to make between role pivot and industry pivot, because those are two very different buckets. Um, and I know you also mentioned that 
you're going to have a PDF of questions to ask during networking events. I think that's going to be super helpful because I think many people know, especially in today's job market, you have to leverage your network, like the traditional ways of sending your job application in aren't as effective right now anymore, just because there are many more people on the job market. So I'm looking forward to seeing that, that list of questions. And I think it'll be super helpful for everybody in the room here today. All right, so we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Anya, I'm gonna read your question here from the chat. Um, as a chief of staff, my skill set is so broad, it feels impossible to move into a line function from here. Any tips on finding a path forward? Do you have a view on what typical options are? Yeah, well, first and foremost, it's definitely not impossible. Um, I think when you reflect on some of the things that we've spoken about here today, you want to ask yourself, like, you're right, it's broad. But if you had to bucket your role into any given role is usually, let's call it between four and eight buckets, right? If you had to say, I spend five to 10 percent of my time here and I spend 15 to 20 percent of my time here and you bucketed your week into a pie chart. I love the pie chart concept. Um, you might want to ask yourself, like, which slices of the pie would I want to be a bigger slice, right? Like, what do I enjoy the most? What's natural? What's interesting to me? And you might even say, you know, an exercise that sometimes I'll give my clients is draw a blank pie chart and literally just decide what would go in it in an ideal world. Imagine you just have like white space to decide how might I break up the slices of the pie if I were to just design my ideal work week? So you could say, here's my current state role. Here's sort of ideal division of time. Um, but the beauty of being so broad is you can sort of decide where might I expand. And then again, when you're pivoting into a line function, let's say, um, you know, certifications, courses, projects, or Internal mobility could be an option. You may, you know, when you're currently working, if you're pursuing a pivot, go to those teams internally and say, how can I support you? How can I get more involved? Can I shadow? Can I volunteer my time on this project? How can I, you know, sometimes you'd be surprised to move into a role and just having exposure, direct exposure by joining a project team in a volunteer capacity by seeing what they've done over the course of three months. Um, you can really show that you have a deep understanding of how that function works. Um, but yeah, if you are currently working, how can you leverage your current company to get more involved where you want to? Um, in terms of typical options, I see Clara was just uh, sort of mentioning that. It's, it's hard for me to say and sort of give obvious examples. And Clara, I don't know if you want to sure. chime in on like common trends that you've seen post chief of staff role like have you seen anything and and the reason like I'm curious what you see but the reason I don't love to like give those examples is because look someone might go into HR or marketing or strategy or product or whatever it may be or operations but like that may be more or less right for you right so if I give you some examples just make sure you're asking yourself who am I right like yes you've had exposure right. to these things but taking common examples sometimes helps but really learning about like, what are all the line functions and what am I like? You know, it's it's almost uh, as if you have so many options, right? Because of your broad exposure. So definitely let's talk about those examples, but just don't feel like you're confined to what is common or what anyone else has done. Those are just examples. And to be honest, anywhere that you've had exposure to me as a chief of staff, any uh, line function that you supported, is an option for you to move into. I mean, that's how I think about it, right? Or maybe there's a line function you haven't had exposure to. It's hard to say without knowing more about who you are exactly, right? But, you know, I know people like stories and examples. So Clara, like what have you seen as a uh, common if, if you've seen any sort of commonalities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I dropped an issue of the newsletter that I wrote a little while ago about some common um, potential paths. And I think, what Rachel said about you've got to do step A before step B, right? And think back to why you even took the chief of staff role in the first place, right? Some people come in with a very clear intention that they want to become a founder in the future. And that's why they take the chief of staff role. They want to sit next to a founder, see how it's done. And then maybe it's time now that you want to start your own thing. So becoming a founder or a CEO is a really great option because you've had that firsthand exposure. Now you get to take the decision making into your own hands. Another one is moving internally within the company and seeing where the gaps are, because to Rachel's point, 
you've seen a lot of stuff. So you know what the company needs. And so if you are still very much in that service leader, like servant leadership, service oriented role, maybe you take a look around in your company and say, hey, we actually don't have a marketing person. And I would like to flex a little bit more on that. So maybe I go and head that department or HR or people or whatever it might be that, again, fills your cup, but is also a need within the company. And then the other part is maybe you like being broad and that's totally okay. You don't have to step out of the chief of staff role after the 18 to 24 months that a typical quote unquote typical chief of staff role usually is. Um, I think if you're a great chief of staff, your principal is going to want to keep you as a chief of staff. But what you should do is reevaluate your own job description and say, well, this is what I was hired to do six months ago. I did this. Now I'm doing this. Where do you want to do your next, you know, six months, and what are the skill sets that you would like to flex on? Um, I know it's always sounds fun to like be broad, but I guarantee you there's stuff that you don't want to do, right? As a chief of staff, when I was at a Series A, I hated doing QuickBooks. I hated doing like the finance and accounting stuff. And even though it let me stay wide, I just didn't want to do that. And so that was an opportunity to hire a finance manager. So then I could focus on more strategy or more onboarding or whatever it might be. So those are typical paths. The world is your oyster. I think that's the thing that makes it hard. But in what Rachel has said, it's about doing this internal reflection, do the pie chart exercise. Think about the things that you are good at, the things that you want to do, the things that need to get done. Find the Venn diagram of what that is, and that will hopefully help you drive those decisions as you try to figure out what's next. Yeah, I think that's an amazing point. Like we've seen VP level chiefs of staff. I mean, you can really grow and you can be senior and you can um, maybe adjust your role title or your compensation, but it is okay to grow in that capacity and say, how can I still, like a chief of staff is a right hand to a leader. Like, is there a world that your title and your comp grows and you can still be in that same capacity? I don't, I do think sometimes chiefs of staff feel like, they may have to move on, but I think that's an amazing point that if that is the right role for you, how do you still grow and advance uh, without feeling like you have to go into some other capacity? And I love what Clara is saying. It's a perfect example. If there's things you want to do less of, can you hire some sort of vendor or outsource or manage it or hire some assistant level? Maybe you, you get more senior and you hire some more junior level person, whether it's a junior chief of staff or whether it's a assistant of some kind, executive whatever it may be, but what are the things that as you grow and advance as a professional and as a chief of staff that you want to do more of, you still can have stretch projects and capabilities to grow and be a better support to your leader and grow your level, right, of, of just yourself and your capabilities um, in those ways without necessarily having to move to another team or another title. So I think that's an absolutely great point. Perfect. Thank you for that, Rachel. I'm going to skip ahead to a question that's getting a lot of emoji pluses and thumbs up here so that, you know, it seems like many people have this question. Yeah. So Carolyn asks, how can you best explain a chief of staff role that was heavily defined by the founder's needs and be able to clearly delineate your areas of expertise beyond being a great right hand? Yeah. So in terms of explaining the role that was heavily defined, well, um, Okay, so there's a few things. Um, being able to clearly delineate your areas of expertise. Okay, it depends what we're um, practicing here. So there's, first of all, there's written materials. You might have a professional summary. You might have the resume. You might have your LinkedIn about section. You might have your headline. You can have a cover letter. You can have a video pitch. There's so many written digital materials to showcase your expertise. And that would be one way of trying to organize and synthesize on paper, the different buckets and the different components of what it went into your role. And there's ways of visually formatting it. So the slices of your pie chart are clear on paper. If we're talking about how to explain it out loud, I think there's a few common questions. There's the tell me about yourself question. And then there's what did you do in this role or what what was your role tell me about tell me about your role that's such a broad question so like any interview practice you want to figure out how to best synthesize that so the tell me about yourself question i like to use the framework of background strengths direction within the background sentence you can 
do exactly what you just said, Caroline, which is delineate. If you had to synthesize the, let's call it between five and eight hard skills or functional areas that you supported, how do you synthesize that for someone else? A big part of this is synthesizing it on paper for yourself and then practicing it out loud so that it's easily uh, communicated and you can just quickly say, well, as a chief of staff, I, you know, or my background is across A, B, C, D, and E. And all of a sudden you listed it clearly. There's a few different things. They're different, but you've simply just said it clearly. So half the battle is thinking about it, organizing it for yourself and practicing it out loud. It's okay that there was a lot going on and they were broad, but how can you pick the top five to eight things to list as part of your background. So again, tell me about yourself, background, strengths, direction. If they say, tell me about your time at X company, again, you really, like any interview question, you have to ask yourself, what's a framework I can use to best answer that question? Maybe you give them an overview of the five to 10 core areas that you oversaw. Maybe you then give them a very brief example of a core project or core client or core outcome. And then maybe there's some third component to the, you know, you, with any interview question, you want to ask yourself, what's, how can I break, break it down? What might be the core ways I describe it? You could explain high level areas and then an example story, or you could say there was four main areas of my role, this, 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 and this. Each person's different and how it makes sense to you, but half the battle is just trying to organize and synthesize it for yourself and then practicing how to make it easily understood by someone else, right? Like even though there's broadness, you can synthesize the top few buckets or areas, right? So it, it just takes a little thought and practice really to make it, you know, something you can easily communicate. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'm going to just kind of double click on this question here, because Carolyn, if I can read into your question a little bit, um, I think that sometimes there's this feeling of what do I put on my resume, provide, you know, was the right hand to my founder or to the CEO, and that feels like, well, that encapsulates everything I've done, um, but break that down further and don't be afraid to take responsibility for the things that your founder has accomplished because they wouldn't have been able to do that without you. And I think that's often a fear that I see with a lot of chiefs of staff is like, well, I was directed, right, to run the strategy on this, or I was directed to create a hiring plan and a hiring process. Yes, maybe you were given that direction, but then you executed on it, right? And so those are the things that you should be highlighting on your resume. You know, how did you go about building out a hiring process? You know, how many ATSs did you have to research? Why did you end up going with that one? Um, how many stakeholders did you have to get involved, you know, from HR to people to finance in order to make all of these happen? And when your company has accomplishments, if they raise another series, if they bring a product to market, um, all of those things you are quote, unquote, indirectly responsible for, but think about what the role you played in that process were, was and put that on your resume. Um, don't be afraid for, take, for taking responsibility for that because I think that sometimes we do feel like because we are in a servant role, um, we, we can't take responsibility, but that is exactly your job. And that is a thing that you wanna highlight. So I wanted to kind of leave, leave Carolyn with this uh, bit of nugget of information that I've seen. <laughs> Yeah. Um, amazing. Well, I think we are just at time here. We have about a minute. So Rachel, I want you to plug everything. Where can people find you? How can people connect with you if they want to get more resources? What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yes. Um, LinkedIn, it's just my full name. Definitely follow and connect. I try to post as much helpful stuff as I can. Um, our website, I will pop it in here again. We have a lot of free stuff like downloadables, meditations, guides, videos, blogs, you name it. Um, and we always offer a free initial chat. So if you wanted some one-on-one -on -one support, if you're figuring out debating the chief of staff role or debating what's next for you, coaching is here to really guide you through everything we just talked about today. So I'm happy to chat one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and yeah, just, uh, keep in touch, follow us on our website. We have, you know, you can pop your email in if you want to be notified about future events as well, always make these webinars free so that you guys can stay in touch, but, um, yeah, follow me, stay in touch. I hope this was helpful and hopefully we will meet again soon. 
Amazing. Everyone, please give a huge virtual round of applause and thank you to Rachel. This was such an incredible workshop. I know we worked through a lot of this brainstorming and reflecting quickly, but watch the recording back, take the time to really do these questions. And I would highly recommend scheduling some time with Rachel if you can uh, to really kind of dig deeper into this. So we hope to see you all at the next workshop. Um, we just launched our Ask a Chief of Staff community. So if you're not already a part of it, all of these workshops will be free to our members in the future. Otherwise, stay tuned. Um, we'll come out with a new newsletter in the next week for more events and workshops and words of wisdom from all of our speakers. So I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your week. Hope to see you all soon again and have a happy Wednesday. Bye, everyone.